apparently Manhattan Beach is unwilling to do, and I want to apologize to the Bruce family for the injustice. Justice for Bruce's Beach. Uh, yeah, we can't get enough of this story. As uh, we first told you last week, we've been following for months now, nearly 100 years after a beachfront property in Southern California was stolen from Charles and Willa Bruce. You saw and you heard Governor Newsom right there sign a bill to return it to their family. Here to tell us what that means for other cases and reparations in general is our justice correspondent, Candace Kelly. Good morning. Good to see you, Candace. So good let's talk morning. about this because people are excited about this. Yes, good morning. It is good morning, especially for the descendants of uh, Bruce's Beach. Uh, some people have said that this makes a case for reparations in general. But from what I understand, a lot has to do with the evidence of what was already lost. Explain that. Yeah, you know, what was really important here with Bruce's Beach is that you had a whole history in terms of newspapers, witnesses, um, uh, deeds, things of that nature, the land itself, in order to show you what had been lost. And then in addition, you had people who were part of his family um, to come forward and talk about this history and, and have pictures and things of that nature. So whenever you go to court, it's all about the evidence. And that's essentially what we're doing here. We're kind of putting ourselves in front of the court of law to say this land is my land, this land is not your land. So it really depends upon the evidence, which is why reparations for slavery has come to a halt in so many ways because it's hard to figure out what's the formula that we figure out in terms of who gets what because we're not from the same place and we don't all have the exact same lineage. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you next. How how does that relate to slavery in general when we're talking about this case, we're talking about the Tulsa massacre situation that's going on in general? How do we look at the what was directly lost? Do we look at lives lost, which is uh, invaluable, or do we look at lost wages and the fact uh, they got that uh, there's so many people here got free uh, 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 labor for so many years uh, out of the slaves? You know, what's interesting is that there's this organization that came out as a result of this advocacy for, for, Bruce, for Bruce's Beach called Where Is My Land? And this is an advocacy group that not only wants to fight for land, but to fight for other values in terms of business or just anything that you want to fight for. So to answer your question, these things are popping up in terms of organizations to help people find out and trace their history, trace their roots to figure out what actually belongs to them. This is really a good sign for people. This is a good sign because finally the doors are open and land is actually given back after 100 years. Now certainly when we talk about slavery, we're going back, back further, but this certainly is going to be a good precedent case for other people to look at and use as kind of a deciding factor. As long as I said before, as if the evidence is there, if there's information, if there are witnesses, if there's a paper trail to show that this can be gotten and that this is due to the ancestors of, of whoever were, were taken advantage of, whether it was workers or whether it was people who simply um, uh, lost their businesses, maybe they were entrepreneurs, or in this case, like the Bruce family, they, they lost property and it was regained. Okay, so it's one thing to regain the property, give it back to me, but it's been decades since the property was taken away from me. That means there was a lot of money that was probably lost. There could have been things I could have done with that land. I could have sold that land or whatnot. Uh, is there any kind of monetary gain or monetary reward that the state of California plans to give to the uh, descendants of the Bruce Beach uh, because well, you know, of that? It's one thing to have it. It's great to have it. But at the same time, what about the money that was lost from my family? You know, that's a very good point. This this land today is worth between 72 to $75 million. I mean, at this point, they can actually do whatever they want with it. That was one of the things that came along with this particular law that was signed into law and codified for the transfer of this property, is that these people who did get the land, the Bruce family, w did not have to be held accountable in terms of the zoning laws. Now, the zoning laws say that this has to be used for something that's recreational and related to beachfront, mm -hmm. but they excluded them from that and said, well, you can do with whatever what you want. But in terms of property monies that were lost along the years, there's really no concession made for that. But at least the money was given back and these zoning laws don't kind of kind of constrict them in terms of doing what they want to do. I mean, maybe they want to build a bit large beachfront house on there, or maybe they want to do something mm -hmm. private for, the, for their own concern. So they're, they're not married to the zoning law. So that's the one caveat here in terms of this law being signed. 
Candace, do we know what they want to do with it? I mean, if they want to sell it, I mean, $72 million is a lot of money, but do we know uh, what they're going to do with the land? They say they do not know what they want to do with the land. I mean, I would imagine in order to kind of restore history and get back to where they left off, that there would be something recreational. I mean, wouldn't it be lovely to have something where, you know, African-Americans go to, and certainly that's open up to everyone, but might be an African-American hotspot with a restaurant and a jazz bar and a dance floor, everything that was there before. But they haven't made um, any suggestions or didn't give any ideas about what this land would be so far. Okay, before I let you go, uh, it's awesome. Uh, we're still also waiting to hear a, a judgment in the case in the Tulsa massacre situation. Uh, if that case uh, can go forward when it comes to the descendants uh, of that situation, of the three descendants there. If that is allowed to proceed um, and they win, let's say they win that case, in addition yes. to what has happened here with this reparation case, will that be catastrophic moving the needle forward when it comes to reparations, when it comes to slavery? How can that Listen, be used the, as precedent? The, the, the reason why the Tulsa, Tulsa massacre case is so important is because they're presenting this case as a public nuisance. And that's something that's available in any state across the country. So once you have that precedent in other jurisdictions, you can use it and say, listen, there was a public nuisance not only then, but there was a public nuisance here, meaning that the government or the mm -hmm. state or whoever they're suing did or did not do something in order to enable the structural racism to exist. And that structural racism is the public nuisance. So I would say that that would be an even bigger deal, actually, than this case right here. If they're able to move forward mm. with that, so that there could be a public nuisance, not only in that state, but in states across the country, that would be an amazing precedent and something to build on. Yeah, and that judgment can be coming down at uh, any time. And once it does, of course, we'll report it here and I'll have reaction for you on BNC. Candace Kelly, always great seeing you looking beautiful and yellow today. Of course, well, thank uh, we're going to check back in with you a little bit later this morning, but you always look great. Appreciate it. <laughs>